Before we get started in this episode, a quick announcement. As you know, I'm very passionate about acceptance and commitment therapy, and I also run a busy practice in Canberra. We're currently looking for psychologists who are registered in Australia to join our team, who are also passionate about learning about ACT. We provide supervision on a group and individual basis and training around ACT. So if this is you, if you're interested, please express your interest at strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers. Look forward to hearing from you. And now back to this episode. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Today's guest on Better Thinking is Peter Graham, and the topic is retirement. It might sound like a bit of a bland topic, but in actual fact, Peter really knows his stuff and raises some incredibly fascinating points, particularly around how to best plan for a lifestyle of retirement, not the financial side. So listen in and enjoy. And if you like this, please share with others because I think it's a really important topic for our community to be aware of. Peter Graham, thank you and welcome to the show. Thanks, Nish. Appreciate you coming on to talk about today's topic being retirement, everything from how to plan, how to live in retirement, lifestyle aspects. Uh, And I know that uh, even though you've got a wealth of knowledge in the financial side, but we're going to put that probably a little bit to the side and look at the psychological aspects more than anything else. Well done, yeah. Mm. So maybe a good good place to start, and I'm not really sure. Maybe we can hear about your journey, how this kind of came about, because prior to us uh, starting in the, the actual recording, you were talking about there's very little um, known in this space in terms of people who you're competing against, that, that uh, there's not many services out there that focus on how do we retire well? Uh, there's plenty. There's plenty to do with finances, but not necessarily from that more humanistic space. So, how did that all come about? Well, I spent fifty years as a financial advisor, and a lot of it here was was here in Canberra. Um, one of the things I learned is that people didn't retire very well. They had a lot of money, and so they the financial side was was okay, but. In truth, what happens out there is that most people think retirement is all about money. And if you look at all the promotions by the banks and the financial advisors and um, uh, super funds and that type of thing, they all talk about the amount of money that you need in retirement. But I've learnt that it's not about money. You need money, but it's not about money. Uh, Retirement is about um, lifestyle. So the... uh, there's a good possibility these days that people will be retired for about 30 years. Now, if that's the case, that's 176,000 hours of daylight awake that you've got to fill in. And you don't spend much of that time thinking about money. So what you do is you have to live that time. And um, it's sad, really, uh, that people don't concentrate on the important issues in retirement. For example, we know that the average retiree in Australia watches nine hours of television a day. Now, that Average. Average. Now, that's, I've been told that's wrong by the children of my clients, <laughs> that it's more like 15 hours a day. Now, that's, that's some... I don't watch television at all, so it really doesn't bother me, but... Um, it's really interesting, and I'm not talking about actually sitting watching television. I'm, I'm saying it might be television, it might be social media, it might be Netflix, it could be, I don't care what it is, but it's this involvement in media uh, of any, any type. And just the fact that you might be cooking and the cricket comes on, so you start watching that, or you're doing something else and a politician makes an announcement, so you stop... And it's all this business about trying to do two things at once. And, of course, when you do that, you, you and I know that you can't be successful in any of them, any of these activities you're doing. You've got to concentrate on one thing at a time. So what I'm saying is people are influenced by television, social media and the like. 
And so you'd get to the part, the time where a person dies after 30 years of retirement and they'd have as their epitaph, they would have lived for 30 years since retirement, was able to watch 99,000 hours of television and can't tell you which is the best hour. That's how sad it is. And it really is amazing the influence that television has on people. And half the problem is that they enter retirement without any preparation. And they know they have to prepare. And so when they retire, they sit down and they think, right, I've got to get, uh, what will I be doing? Well, I'll just sit down here for a second and get some inspiration. They turn on the television and really that's the end of it. So my target market is to talk to people 50 plus and still working. And the reason is that if those people have the information required to have a fantastic retirement, they've got many years to create the habits which will allow them to have a smooth transition into this amazing experience called retirement. Can we maybe just stop there for a minute and, 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 and try and define what retirement is? Is because I've got this little thing in my head. I I've been thinking about it for 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 some time, just because I reference, um, you know, that I'll never retire. Um, my my reference in my mind is, uh, I'm going to transition from paid employment to unpaid employment. Uh, that, that that there's something about the way that probably my personality is type A. You know, I like to go go go, keep doing things. Uh, I, I I see there just being you know, no actual year or no actual date. Um, it's just something that, that that's in my fabric. Um, but that's me personally. That you know, I'm not everyone by by any means. Um, it's, that's only my definition. How do we define or how do we understand what retirement is? Well, most of us have an image of what retirement is about, and that is usually brought about by our parents and the people we've been associated with over the years. And we've seen what others are doing. We've listened to the government. We've listened to other people talk about retirement. I worked out that the most important thing to do is to redefine your definition of retirement. That's why my company is named Redefining Retirement Proprietary Limited. It's important that we all stop and say, what is my retirement going to look like? I don't care what the government says. I don't care what my mother and father did. I don't care what anything else is happening. How am I going to fill in my time? Now, your definition absolutely is like mine. I'm 76 and too young to retire. That's how I, <laughs> that's how I um, um, mention that, that fact. The bottom line is that you have to absolutely redefine your life. You've had a uh, 30, 40 years of work and you've been rushing around with goals and plans and targets and profitability and achievement and doing all these things. The mere thought that retirement is a time when all that stops and you do nothing is crazy. And it reminds me of the, the cartoon of years gone by where... One guy's walking along and he comes across a friend and he says, what are you doing? And he said, nothing. And he said, you were doing that yesterday. And he said, yeah, well, I haven't finished yet. (laughs) And that's the problem with retirement because too many people think retirement is about doing nothing. And it is until you realise it's not. Doing nothing is a complete and utter waste of time. And the negativities associated with doing nothing are extraordinary, not the least of which you increase your chances of achieving one of the great fears in retirement, and that's called Alzheimer's. Now, it's fascinating. I find all this absolutely fascinating because you really have to decide how you are going to fill in 176,000 hours Now, don't do the television watching. That's crazy. You can never learn anything from television. You can never... Nobody can ever tell me what it is that was so important about television that they have positively changed their life. You can't. 
It's not, that's not what it's for. So how are you going to fill in time? Now, we don't know how much time we've got. Might be 10 minutes, might be 10 hours, 10 weeks, 10 months, 10 years. Could be anything. But we have to live the life as though we're going to live a long time. And that's one of the keys of deciding how to have a good retirement is deciding that you are going to live a long time. Not saying I'm going to die at 80 or I'm going to die at 75. That's the absolute negativity that you can get involved in if you think that way. But if you're going to live a long time, you then have to plan what you're going to do over that period of time. And well, let me put it this way. When I give talks at conferences and meetings and the like, if I'm talking to a group of retirees, I ask the question before I start the actual process. I say, oh, by the way, when I mention the word retirement, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? And these are all retirees and I've listened to what they say and 57% have all said the same thing. I'm bored. Now, I don't know about you, but with about three billion things to do, I can't understand how you can be bored. So there's no reason to be bored because the problem is if you're bored, you become boring. And boring people, well, well we won't go there. It's, it's not nice. It's interesting that, that boredom, you know, every, everyone that you talk to at a, uh, who isn't in retirement, who's looking forward to it, uh, in their mind... Uh, there's all these op- opportunities to to do nothing, as 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 we kind of you know uh, just briefly touched on it. For me, nothing means deliberately doing nothing, rather than nothing as a default. So, when I go on holiday, the idea is, you know, we say it's nothing, but it, it is something. You're you're on holidays. You're actually mm. away from work, and mm. what you end up doing is sitting on the beach. Uh, so you might not be doing something that we call productive, um, but in actual fact it's incredibly productive for my own well-being yeah. and, and, and satisfaction in actual fact, you know. Uh, because if someone says, oh, you know, uh, what did you do? And I said, you know, built sandcastles with my daughters and you know, walked on the beach. Uh, they don't question that. They go, that was lovely. Um, but I wasn't being productive. Uh, but in many ways, you know, if we define productive, it's certainly productive for my daughters. It's certainly productive for my soul certainly productive for you know, my relationship and, and the like. Uh, but it's kind of like I think there's a difference between being deliberate, uh, deliberately doing nothing uh, versus a default position of I'm bored, I don't know what I'm doing, so I end up flicking channels, you know, swiping, looking at screens. Well, you're right. It's impossible to do nothing, absolutely impossible Once you understand that, then you can start looking at, well, what am I going to do which is going to be meaningful and productive? For example, I go down the coast a lot and uh, I like to do some fishing. Now, I've worked out that there are two types of fishing. There's catching fish (laughs) and fishing. Now, I like (laughs) fishing. I just like standing there and going down at some unearthly hour in the, uh, the night and Staying there until the morning. My wife doesn't understand it. She doesn't understand why I like fishing. It's like, you know, you can just go buy fish. It's like, you can, but uh, then you're not standing around doing nothing. <laughs> That's right. And, and, it's, and it's all about your perception of what you're doing and whether it's, and, and it's important. Uh, and I, uh, I just watch people with hobbies, for example. They are so engrossed in it. It doesn't matter. And it's wonderful. Um, It really doesn't matter what they achieve. It's keeping the mind active and on the go and and, and doing things that interest you. That's the most important thing. And they are most productive to the individual 
Other people are saying, oh, what's all that about? But to the individual, it's quite productive. Let, let me play devil's advocate because I, 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 I see younger persons as well in a, in a similar state. You know, often in depression you see um, people who are bored, they don't have direction, purpose and the like. And even when exploring, you know, what are even just points of interest, hobbies, things that, that, that give you some, some level of satisfaction, uh, the devil's advocate would say, but I can't go fishing all day can't go fishing every day. What do you say to, to that? Well, that's, that's an interesting question because, again, it's a matter of how you perceive choices. You've got to look at the opportunities and, as old Churchill said, what's important, what's urgent, and you've got to work out what you want to do or have to do and should do and the like and then get on with it. Now, it's... it's, uh, it's It's interesting to me that so few people do this. They they now for example, we know that in retirement there are thirty one things people need to think about before retirement. And thirty one things they need to think about after retirement. Most people think there's one which is money and, and I've got to say that's not the answer. Most people have no idea what the 31 are. They've never really thought about it. And it's the same with filling in time. They've never really thought about it. It's the same as exercise. They've never really thought about it. They've never really thought about much at all when it comes to life in retirement. And I'm suggesting to people that they at least find out the facts and think about it. That's what we teach and I coach people in how to retire. What are some of the 31? Well, the most important one, I believe, is meeting people. Um, what? Well, yes, it is, meeting people. You see, what happens as we get older your friends start departing. Now, they might go and live in a retirement village somewhere else, or they might go to an aged care facility, or they might die, or they might get Alzheimer's, or they might just decide not to talk to you again. But your circle of friends is getting smaller and smaller all the time. And what happens is that people start talking more and more and more to fewer and fewer people, and it's just boring it is just so boring it doesn't matter and and so meeting people is really important and you've got to get out there and learn how to meet people most people don't know how to do that but you've got to go and learn to meet people and I can remember I was at one uh, um, function uh, and a lady stood up and said excuse me but I don't like meeting people that I don't know and I said well do you mind if I ask you a question? And she said, no. I said, have you got any friends at all? And she said, yes, of course I have. Did you know them before you met them? Well, she sat down. And that's the issue, that none of us know any of our friends or knew any of our friends before we actually met them. So you meet them and you turn them into friends if that's the way it goes. And so I encourage people to look at friendships in this way. I ask people to simply sit down and write a list of their friends. Just write their names down, you know, Fred and John and Bill and all this type of stuff. I don't care. Just write them down. Then after that, I want you to look at those friends and decide whether they are one of four types of friends. Must friends, trust friends, just friends or rust friends. Now, most of us have a few must and trust friends. They're the really important ones. Haven't seen them for five years and you get together and you think, God, it was only yesterday. That type of friendship that you can't do without them, they are, they are what makes life interesting. You get on to the just friends, and we've got hundreds of those. You've probably got thousands of them. I've got thousands of them. People that you've met at functions and conferences and events and dinners and this type of thing, nice people. If you meet them in the street, they say, hey, how about a cup of coffee? That'd be great. So you have a cup of coffee and you don't see them for five years. 
They're not interested in you and really you're not that interested in them. And then you've got the Russ friends who've all got a heap of those. They're people that have been through your life and they're no longer part of your friendship group. So think of your friends in must and trust, the important ones, and then the just and rust friends. But the most important group is another group, and it's called emerging friends. And these are people that you have met. And, you know, you deep down, you think, hey, that was good, I enjoyed that person, let's catch up again. They're the type of people that may turn into a must or a trust friend. And if they do, you are rebuilding your reservoir of friends so that you will have a great retirement. For example, most of us have seen the group of blokes that sit around and talk, maybe Italian or Spanish or Greek or something like that, and they just sit around and talk and talk and talk and talk. They're not relatives. They're friends. And the most important people to develop are friends. So if you look at all the, the blue zones, they're all the zones where people live a long time. All of those people, there's lots of things associated with blue zones. Look it up on the internet, it's really interesting. But one of the things that associates with people, associated with people in the blue zones is the friendship group. And they've all got a, a large group of friends And those friends are not family. They are people that they've known since childhood or whatever the case may be. They're people that we've worked on and they've become good must-and-trust friends. So meeting people is one of the most important things that people can do in retirement. Get out there and learn how to meet people. It just sounds so stupidly obvious, right? Yet... If I look at my own behaviour, I am not very deliberate or conscious in developing emerging friends. uh, If I kind of reflect, I I stick with my old friends, um, you know, my my, my current trust and and must, uh, and only uh, spend time in, in fostering more of that or become disappointed that uh, maybe they're finding emerging friends and I'm, you know, starting to experience, you know, fewer opportunities or something. As where when I think about my wife, uh, one of the things that I love about her is is she, she, I think she could have, you know, a thousand and one emerging, you know, must and trust friends that she can develop at, 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 you know, the drop of a hat. Uh, It's almost like there's a closed-mindedness behind myself uh, that I need to ensure I look at because mm. otherwise I think you know, the future could be very lonely uh, if oh. I if I don't um, right. you know foster and, and, and be deliberate and mm. and kind of recognise that you know, uh, th- 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 there's almost like you know, I'm just kind of reflecting the psychological side. Uh, there's almost like a, a an idea that's stuck in my head which says you know friendships have to be a long term thing. But that's already established rather than it's a long-term thing that I could establish today with someone mm. brand new. Um, but there's, there's that constant competing, I don't know, the time sort of nonsense, mm. uh, which is just clearly, you know, not, not true. Well, meeting people is really difficult for most. Uh, for example, I have no trouble in meeting people. I walk a lot. And when I go for my walk, and it's usually in the morning or the afternoon, but it can be any time during the day, I talk to every single person I see where it's convenient and not rude or, you know, obviously the incorrect thing to do. So when I go out walking, I first of all, I like to talk to all the dog owners. They're the easiest people to, walk, uh, to talk to. And... Um, You've got to have something to say to people. And the problem with meeting people is most people don't know what to first say. They do not know what to say. So I've got a whole lot of lines that I've developed over the years. For example, if the person's being dragged along by their dog, I just say, how do you like being taken for a walk in the morning? 
Well, they love that. They, you know, and they stop and they talk. Um, other examples um, might be um, with young kids. I like to stop and talk to the mothers and just tell them what a lovely child they are and how happy they are and all this type of thing. And you start talking. Another example is I was I live in Sydney and I was getting off a ferry in Sydney. Now, when you get off a ferry in Sydney, there's a, a single gangplank in this example, uh, a single gangplank. And um, there are two types of queues. The British, that's one after each other, and the Italian where they're all trying to get off at the same time. <laughs> so it's just typically the Italian queue. And, and I'm standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. My turn came along. Now, I'm 60... Sorry, I'm 76, right? And I'm standing there and next to me is a young lady going to work. And I said, look, excuse me, you go first. And she said, no, no, you go first, you're in front of me. And I said, I'd really appreciate if you'd go first. My mother might be watching. Well, she (laughs) roared with laughter (laughs) and we got off the ferry and we walked. Now, I didn't need to walk where she walked to, but it was such an interesting discussion. She was happy and I was happy when we went our separate ways. I've never seen her again, so I'll never will see her again probably. But the point about it is that I made her happy, she made me happy, we made each other happy and we all had a good day as a result, all about meeting somebody you didn't know. So I do that in coffee shops, I do it in everywhere I go. For example, I had a cup of of coffee around the corner here and I said to the lady, okay, who gave you that lovely smile? Well, you know, it's always the same answer, my mother, they all say that, but... The point about it was that she was happier and I was happier just by making a comment. So when I finished the coffee, I took the coffee cup up to the the counter and the the lady came along and said, no, 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 you don't have to do that. And I said, oh, yeah, my mother might be watching. I've got to do the right thing. She laughed, I laughed, and then I said, you know, mothers are like that, aren't they? And yes, 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 everybody understands that. But it's not that. It's about creating conversations. And you never know where those conversations will go. You never know. And so learning the skill of meeting people is one of the great skills for having a fabulous retirement. That might be one of the reasons why I love camping so much. Because I spend so much time you know, racing around in life, not, not uh, pausing to... Uh, develop those relationships during camping I can because there's another family in the same uh, camping area and you know the kids come together and we'll end up having a chat and seeing where they're they're from and what's brought them to the campsite and you know you immediately have much much, many many things to to talk about uh, which we don't often foster or or deliberately do Um, Maybe that's one of the reasons why I enjoy uh, uh, camping so much as well as obviously being in touch with yeah. nature. Um, never thought about that. And having a series of questions to ask in the back of your mind is really important. For example, you might uh, meet someone, instead of saying, hello, how are you, which is the densest thing you can ever say, <laughs> how are you, <laughs> fine, well, there's another brilliant answer, fine. There's no truth in fine. So having the right questions is really important. So it might be, um, what's the most exciting thing you're going to do in the next 12 months? Or have you been to any fantastic shows? Or not so much now, but in the past, you could say that. But learning to ask questions which which will promote conversation. That's what my wife does. You don't want a yes and no answer. You've got to ask a question that will not elicit a yes or no answer. And that's important. It's really, really interesting how some people have that available to them. It, it, it comes quite naturally and others have to practice it. And, and what I'm hearing is that many of us are out of practice. We, we've stopped doing it. Maybe we did it when we were younger and that's how we developed uh, those friendships that we now call you know, must and trust uh, friendships. 
but we've kind of gone out of practice or we've given ourselves some nonsense reasons that we don't do it anymore, like I'm too busy or you know, I, I can't get around to see all my friends now, so why would I get, get more? Um, just picking out of the, 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 the ones that come to mind for me. But this is a practice, you know. It sounds like these, the uh, being so well versed in these in, in these starting points, uh, f- naturally promotes more questions. There's a natural curiosity. It's kind of how you're meeting the world is is what you're trying to make people aware of, uh, rather than being complacent and and. Um, uh, going back to that default, trying to be mindful and present and conscious of what am I trying to do here. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and one it's very easy to meet people in the door. Yeah. I mean, you sit on a, 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 you know, you know, on a plane or on a bus or, you know, um, you can ask simple questions like, are you coming or going? And they stop and they start talking and that's the really interesting part. They start talking. Uh, I learnt this from a psychologist friend of mine in America. Now, Aaron uh, was a a brilliant psychologist who achieved enormous things. But one day he said, "Um, um, how do you go with shyness? And I said, I'm pretty shy. He said, really? Uh, And he said, yeah. I said, yes. And he said, do you want to solve the problem? I said, sure. And he said, it'll take 10 minutes. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. And he took me down onto the streets of Chicago and he started talking to people immediately. He didn't know any of them, spoke to them. And I learned very quickly that they didn't attack him, they didn't walk away, they didn't insult him, they didn't do anything, they answered the questions. And I learned, I thought, hello, that sounds like a good idea. Well, I started doing, I've been doing it ever since. So you can do it if you want to. So that is one of the most important things I believe that you can do in retirement to have a fabulous retirement. What are some of the other uh, primary things that, that, that come to mind? Obviously, you know, meeting well, people, being deliberate, part of that 31, um, or, or, or even uh, factors that, that you would say are important we need to be considerate okay. about. Well, I met you as a result of watching one of your videos. And Martin Fisk from Men's Link was being interviewed by you and it was a fabulous, fabulous show. Now, years ago, I was involved with Men's Link and I was mentoring for Men's Link. And uh, this description's probably not what they'd say these days, but in those days we were mentoring street kids and people who are young children who are disadvantaged, boys and young men who are disadvantaged in life. And it was an extraordinary experience to do that. I wouldn't say it was easy, but there was a, a sense of satisfaction in doing it. And so that brings up the topic of social contribution. What is it that you can do to help other people? Uh, now, uh, the typical one, oh, well, I belong to Rotary or I, you know, I belong to Red Cross or whatever the case may be. But what else can you do? And there are thousands upon thousands of things that you can do to help other people. Uh, you might like to mow the lawns of your neighbour, for example. I mean, yesterday I was with a, I was putting some money into a machine, to a parking machine. A lady standing behind and she has said, how does this work? And I showed her and I said, have you got, um, you'll need uh, $2. Oh, I'll go to the car and get it. I said, no, 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 here's $2. Now, $2 is not going to break my life, but it made a difference to her and it made a difference to me. So there's a lot of little things that you can do as part of social contribution. For example, my son, um, who's an exceptionally busy um, a geologist, uh, he goes and works at a hospital uh, and it's social contribution, so it's a voluntary situation. He just goes along and meets people who want to talk to somebody. Now, people in hospitals are lonely. They are lonely people. I remember years ago I used to to mentor elderly people and I would go and visit elderly people who had no one to talk to and so I'd sit there and just talk to them for hours on end. 
In truth, they had plenty of people to talk to. It's just that the children didn't turn up because they were busy and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of people out there that need people to talk to them and that's a very simple way that you can involve yourself in social contribution. But there are many other ways. You know, for you might like to get involved in coaching. Uh, I coach. I've got four people in the world that I coach. Um, you might like to mentor young people entering into your profession or your business. They need help. They need help. They're frightened. They don't know where to go. You know, they need people to talk to. So you can get involved in mentoring, you can get involved in, in coaching, but you can also get involved in volunteering. And so there's a hundred places you can go and volunteer. For example, you could ring up the local um, charity around here and say, what do you do on Christmas Day? Well, we feed... I say, so would you like someone to help? Oh, that would be wonderful. Just go along... Forfeit a couple of hours on your Christmas Day and go and serve people that um, um, need your help. I remember I did that. Um, I was at a conference and the, the conference had a, a, a charity that they supported and so a group, I was about 70 of us, went along to a, 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 an organisation that prepared meals and packed them and distributed them to um, poor people, ultra poor people. Now this was in Hong Kong, interestingly enough, and and so we did all this preparation, and then the highlight came when we were able to serve 110 people who sat down at dinner time, at lunchtime. Now these people, they had one meal a day, and this was it. They didn't have any money. They didn't have anything. They didn't have anything. And there we were serving Chinese people who spoke no in in English and I didn't speak any Chinese and it was a brilliant experience. They loved it, we loved it and you just walked away and you thought, hey, that was fantastic, I really enjoyed it. And that's what social contribution does. You feel good but you're doing a whole lot of good for other people. So getting involved in social contribution is really important. It's so heartwarming and, and I'm hearing meaningful. That's when someone participates in social contribution, it gives so much meaning and purpose and value mm. to the giver. It does. Obviously yeah. those who receive, you know, it's beautiful and, and heartwarming for them mm. also. Uh, but there's a... There's a natural transaction that occurs of, you know, in, in giving you, you, you tend to receive yeah. you know, more of that in return. Mm, that's good. Let me talk about another one. I mean, there's a... Please, please. There's only a number. Any number but let me just talk about health and education. But first of all, health. Um, health is the big issue. In, in retirement because health is wealth and health is a choice, your choice. In other words, every individual has a choice as regarding their health. And so staying on top of your health is really important. Now, there's the big ones, is you know, there's um, a heart attack and this stroke and this cancer and, and all these other ones. Uh, They're really important. Get to know what they're about and learn what to do if any of these things happen. For example, when I'm giving a talk to a group of people, elderly people, I get a couple to come up on the stage. Is there a husband and wife out there that wouldn't mind coming up on the stage? There's always one couple. They come up and I turn to the guy and I say, look, you're not going to believe what I'm going to ask you to do. And he said, really? And I said, yeah, I just want you to lie down on the floor. He said, you've got to be joking. I said, no, please just do that. And so he lies down on the floor. And then I say to her, pick him up. And of course, she can't. So I thank them very much and they go and sit down. But the point of the exercise is we have to know what to do when these things happen. If your husband or wife 
partner fall over in the shower, what are you going to do? You can't pick them up. You can't. As you get older, you just can't do it. If your, your partner or anyone else around you has a stroke, what are you going to do? Or they have a heart attack, what are you going to do? Or they have a fit or a, a seizure or anything like that. We've got to learn what to do in these circumstances. Another thing I've done at, at, at these conferences and meetings, I say, is there anyone out there that would like to have a stroke? <laughs> well, that sort of gets their attention. <laughs> now, nobody wants to have a stroke. <laughs> but the interesting thing, as I explain to them, is strokes come from basically two areas. Two areas. Now, about 60%, 70%, there's not much you can do about it. But there's this other area that you can do a lot about. And that's brought about by a simple, simple health issue. High blood pressure. Now, high blood pressure can generally be overcome relatively simply with treatment. And you reduce the chances of having a stroke dramatically by sorting out your high blood pressure. But then I ask the people, if you've got high blood pressure and you do nothing about it, is it reasonable for you to think that your partner or spouse is going to look after you? You've decided not to do anything about it. Is it reasonable that they should look after you? And of course it's not, but they will, but it's not reasonable. And so understanding these important health issues is vitally important in retirement. It's not something you just ignore. It's got something you've got to work out. Uh, getting on to the education, which has got something to do with, with um, um, health. Uh, continuing your growth and education is really important. Too many people, they get to into um, any stage of life, they've got their degree, they think they are inoculated against learning anything else. As you get older, you must keep learning. And I don't care what you learn, go and learn something. Go and learn a language, go and learn how to you know, do a sport or how to write a book or whatever the case may be. You've got to keep learning. I was asked to give a talk to a group of retirees and I said to the organisers, what do you want to speak about? And they said, oh, oh, we don't know. What do you want to talk about? And I thought, hmm, I'll think about that. I went away and I decided I'd give a talk on something I knew nothing about. Why? Because I would learn something and I'd exercise the mind and I'd have to spend time researching it and the like. And so I gave a one-hour presentation on something I knew nothing about to start with, and I know a little bit about it now. It's called cognitive decline. Now, the fascinating thing about retirement is the great fear that most people have is Alzheimer's. Now, we all know what Alzheimer's is, and we know the result of seeing people with Alzheimer's. So I gave this talk on cognitive decline, which talks about things like depression and Alzheimer's and the like. And I did a, a, an incredible amount of research, spoke to people around the world and in Australia, and I read all the papers and I did this type of thing and, and brought together this talk. And we won't go into the results of that because... Uh, it, well, we're going to one result, and that is that you can't stop Alzheimer's coming, but you can delay it. So wouldn't it be real good if you learnt about how to delay it? And interestingly enough, 46 universities in the world have done research on ageing. And they've all come to the same conclusion. That's 46 out of 46 have said the same thing. That there is only one thing that you can do to slow down Alzheimer's and ageing. Answer? Exercise. Now, exercise can be pretty well anything involving movement and doing things. But the, the best one is walking. Not too many people at my age can go swimming. Some do, and that's great. But I can't sw start swimming again now because of issues. 
But you can walk. Most people can walk. And so I walk and walk and walk. Now, I walk about 12 kilometres a day. I've been doing it for years and years and years. Uh, a few, few minor benefits in walking. Um, lower blood pressure, lower cholesterol, lower sugars. You lose weight. You think better. You sleep better. And you improve your chances of delaying cognitive decline. Is it worth doing some exercise? Yeah, I think it rather. I think it is. Now they're the types of things. That's one of the things that people need to think about in retirement. Firstly, education. Keep it going, and find interesting things to do. And secondly, work out what you're going to do about the serious issues that might occur in retirement. Now you can't do everything about everything. There are 500 illnesses out there. You're not going to learn how to reduce that. But the big ones, heart, stroke, cancer, and, and um, uh, the depression family, if you like, um, the dementia family, I'm sorry, which includes depression and Alzheimer's, you can do something about these things. You may not stop it, but you're going to slow it down or reduce the, the chances of getting it. And that comes from you getting involved in education, your self-education, and getting out there and asking the questions and reading and the like. Uh, I was with a lady um, yesterday, and, and, and she's involved in learning Spanish. Going to Spain? No. That's not the point. The point is learning something. She's chosen Spanish. It might be Italian. It could be... Anything else, it doesn't matter, but they're actually getting out there and doing it. And so my process of going out and learning about Alzheimer's and depression and ageing and that type of thing was beneficial to the brain, and that's what we're talking about. So that's another big one when it comes to retirement. How did you learn about retirement? Is this your own practice, being so deliberate, the research that you've done uh, in, in retirement, uh, how did you meet retirement, uh, uh, in, well, at least those, th- those years? I mean, w- once again, we we'll probably have to ask that question of what's your definition of retirement uh, for, 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 for my question to even be valid. But how did you get to, to this point you know is it an interest is it that you've you've seen people <coughs> excuse me struggle uh, so much and part of your contribution your mm. social contrib- contribution is one wanting to help mm. how's that come well, about it, it all um, it started when I was about 60 I realized that I had a good chance of living a long time that's my that's in my family genes and that's the way it is with society these days. We're all living longer. And I thought, how am I going to fill in time if and when I slow down or stop work or whatever I decide to do when the time comes? And so I started thinking as to all the options. I was at a conference um, and they had a um, like a business display area and... And I walked up to one of the stands and it was a stand called After Work Advisors. And this was a Bermudan organisation. I don't mean that in a tax avoidance situation. These people were from Bermuda. And they were talking about a business of creating activities for people to do in retirement. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, that's exactly... And so I got to know those people. And it's developed from there. But I also started looking at people who were older in a different way, not in the financial sense, which I'd been doing for 50 years, but in the lifestyle sense. And it dawned on me that there was a real problem there. Now, I knew I had skills uh, that I could bring to the table. One is understanding the financial side of things. Two... Uh, is I do a lot of public speaking, spoken on radio and spoken on television conferences and done all that type of thing. So I knew I could get my message out to people 
by having this skill. And so I decided I'd work on this. And that's how it's all started and it's been just a fascinating journey and I've spoken all around the world on, on this particular issue because the problems are the same everywhere. Uh, there's not one country in the world that I've been to which have different issues in retirement. And it's, it's important that everywhere in the world, people in the world, learn how to have a great retirement. How do you do it? So what I'm doing is I'm obviously talking to you, but I give a lot of conferences, talks. Uh, the book, um, yeah, that's going to the editor any day now for distribution or publishing and distribution. I'm also developing a 10-module um, um, internet coaching course on how to retire, and that'll be out in the next couple of weeks. And so I'm trying to look at all the different ways in which I can get the message out to people that your retirement is your choice. Nobody else's. How you are going to fill in your retirement is your choice. Not your spouse's choice, not the government's choice, not history, nothing. It's what you are going to do with your time. And that's where I'm going at the moment. Having learnt, back when I was 60, that's seven, well, 16 years ago, I started asking the question, what am I going to do in retirement? One of the things I do now is that I get uh, groups together, usually clients of accountants, lawyers, uh, financial advisors, uh, trustees of super funds, whatever the case may be, they put together a group of 30 people and I give a three-hour presentation on retirement. And for the first time ever, those people walk away with a written plan as to what they might do, it'll change, but what they might do in retirement. And that's a, that's a fabulous way for people to get started on the idea when they're still working. And what will you be doing in retirement, Peter? Well, I know when I'm going to retire, actually, and that is I'm going to retire three days before I die because I've got a lot of paperwork to sort out. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> that's the plan. That, that's how you retire. But let me tell you one interesting thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe um, that's the actual. Maybe that's that's the actual word. You know, when we, when we we uh, retire from life and we pass away, uh, rather than an actual arbitrary number around. You know, you know, working days. You know that 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 we yeah. are contributing all the time. We're part of society that we can enjoy, or at least need to to practice and mm. be cognizant mm. until the day that we retire, um, whenever that might be. Yeah. Let me just tell you something that happened to me, and it could happen to anybody listening to this podcast. I'm not, I hope it doesn't, but it could happen. Earlier on, I talked about health issues and how we've got to be prepared for these health issues. I went to um, my local doctor around here in Canberra years ago, and I said, look, I've got this itch on my back and it just won't go away. And he said, well, where is it? And he said, there's nothing there. And so uh, I went away and I came back and I said, it's still there. And he said, no, and so they did all the tests and there's nothing there. And eventually I went to uh, him and I said, I'd like you to take the itch out. And he, this doctor looked at me and he said, how do you take an itch out? And I said, I don't know, that's your problem. And, of course, doctors are not allowed to go into clear skin and just check to see if there's anything underneath. I'm not allowed to do that. And so I signed the necessary paper, uh, papers to allow him to do this. And he went in there and he found a, a tiny one and a half millimetre white gristly thing, I suppose you'd say. He sent it off to the pathology in Canberra. They didn't know what it was. They sent it to Sydney and Melbourne. They didn't know what it was. Then they sent it to America overnight um, uh, and they came back the next day and they said, you've got melanoma. A very rare form of melanoma. And so I had the um, 
uh, operation expanded to take out all the lymph nodes in the area and all the rest of it. And my lovely surgeon here in town said, look, um, um, don't think that this is the end of it. It may not be. And sure enough, in about a year and a half's time, I went for my annual checkup. And to cut a long story short, the melanoma had started to spread. And, um, and so I went to the Melanoma Institute in Sydney and they uh, um, said, we'd like you to have some tests. And uh, I had the necessary tests and um, the professor said, you've got a problem. I said, he said, she said, you have stage four cancer. And I'd gone from a perfectly clear scan, a little thing on my, my lung, to stage four cancer in about four or five weeks. And interestingly enough, the thing on my lung was not the problem. But that's what happened. And so I was given the news that I really didn't have very long to live and there was only one thing possible and that was to get involved in immunotherapy, a new um, treatment that had been developed in the world. It wasn't in Australia. Um, uh, it was still doing world trials and the professor said, look, I think you should try this. And I said, well, okay. Interestingly enough, we, you're a psychologist. You'll be interested in this. When the professor said to me, you have very few days to live, I said to her, okay, what are we going to do about it? So I didn't fall in a heap. I didn't go negative or anything like that. I just, what are we going to do about it? And this is where this treatment came in. Now, immunotherapy is something that doesn't have an immediate action. It takes a while to react in the body. And she said, we will look after all the health issues. Definitely don't go for any alternative medicines at all. Just don't do it. And I said, well, okay. And she said, the only thing you have to do, Peter, in this period is to stay alive. And I thought... Well, that's interesting. I've never thought about how do you stay alive. And I went home that night and I worked out that there were six things that I had to do to improve my chances of living, staying alive. And I did those over a period of time. And, um, and well, obviously it didn't. It, what I did worked and the, the prediction that I didn't have long to live didn't work. Um. The cost of that was dramatic. Now, it was mainly paid by the Australian government and my health fund and by my wife, myself. Total cost in four years, $1.2 million for a touch of melanoma. The point about it is this, that in retirement you do not know what might happen. So you've got to be ready for... Not so much what might happen, but you've got to learn to have a reaction which will make it possible for whatever's happened to be improved and carried on. You know. So retirement, you never know what's around the corner, but you've got to be ready for it. You've got to be ready for it. I'm not saying you worry about it or think about it, but you've got to say, gee, if I was told I had a heart attack, what would I do? Or I don't want to have a heart attack, what should I do? you know, and change your diet and do all the different things. We should be doing this well in advance. Now, my melanoma, I know it was my fault because I was the one that did all the sunbaking years ago. I know it was my fault. I'm not blaming anybody. And so it should be with other illnesses because we can all do a heck of a lot about resolving our illnesses just by improving our attitude and our actions. So retirement, you never know what's around the corner but it's worth being prepared. Peter, you seem to have a, a really strong optimism bias. I'm, I'm somewhat the same. I, I see a problem and my immediate thought is, it's my fault. Hmm. Uh, 
it allows me to therefore do something about it. That's right. Uh, now, I'm not saying my fault where I'm going to berate myself and you know, whip myself and, 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 and get down and depressed, but rather uh, that immediately gives me the permission to do something about it because it's within my control, at least from that point. Forward. I think attitude is really important and, and, and we all have a choice as to how we react when something happens and it's really important that we have a, an approach to life which increases the chances. So even when I was going through the worst of the treatment uh, and I was getting weaker and weaker and weaker, I kept saying to people that all I had was a touch of melanoma. So I didn't talk about it, didn't complain, I didn't ring everybody up and tell them about it. I didn't do any of that. And my problem, I had to sort it out and I had to address the way to sort it out. And so what I did was I came up with this mantra and I lived every day, still do it today, and that is that every day you must get up, dress up and show up, no matter what, and never, never, never give up. The next thing, there'd be no television, social media or newspapers because they're just negative. When you think about it, they're just negative. There's no sugars. You never eat sugar. Look, you know, we talk about health, but the big issue out there is sugar. That's the main issue that is the problem. So no sugars. 10,000 steps a day. 10,000 steps a day. And I did that every day. Well, until the last few days before I was about to die and didn't. But, but 10,000 steps a day, I did that because I knew that exercise is um, one of the best things that you can do. And it worked out that if you are a healthy person, your resilience factor goes up. Your... Um, um, immune system improves when you are fit. And so the <laughs> personal responsibility, we've all got to get out there and solve these problems before it happens. Now, fortunately, I was, I was fit when this happened and that helped me because I kept walking my 8 to 10 kilometres a day and even today I still do it. You know, uh, even if I have to go out at night time. Last night I was at a, a hotel here in Canberra and I had to go out and do a quick couple of laps of, the, um, of, of, a, of a block just so I could go to bed at night time knowing that I had achieved my target, which was 10,000 steps a day. So it's important that we, we have a very positive approach towards retirement. doesn't matter what the issues are that we've talked about. But if you can be positive, you've got a very good chance of having a really incredible retirement. I think that positivity also comes out in <clears throat> those uh, uh, approaches that you mentioned today in terms of meeting people, mm -hmm. social contribution, you know, your own physical health exercise and, 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 mm -hmm. and the like. Uh, all those things do give one a lot to be positive about. Yeah, and I can't even imagine what the alternative is. I can't, you know, it's so positive. Well, what's the alternative? <laughs> I mean, you know, give me a better one. But to me it doesn't exist. Now, to some people they don't know how to be positive and I understand that, but it's something you've got to work on and maybe they should come and talk to you and, and talk to people about learning how to become positive because... It's interesting. Now, you're a psychologist. My friend in America that I helped me with, the meeting people, he was a psychologist and he was a psychologist for the US swim team and a multitude of other things. And he was the one that helped Mark Spitz get seven gold medals in the Olympic Games. You can't do much without proper advice. Now, proper advice, and I don't care whether it's health or, or um, buying a house or investing or remaining healthy or anything like that, proper advice does not include your family, unless they're qualified, your family, your friends, 
the person you meet at the pub or the person you meet at dinner time on a Saturday night, and it certainly doesn't come from the worst person you can get advice from, and that is yourself. People who think they know enough to make a decision on any of those matters will ultimately fail. We see it all the time in everything we do. Uh, and and that is the, the problem. People don't know the importance of getting advice because you can only be advanced in life. You can only advance in life by taking advice from people who know more than you do and doing something about it. That's it. So why, I don't understand why people don't take advice. It beats me completely. It's absolutely fascinating to me as well. I, I remember... Uh, getting advice around some insurances that I I needed and and uh, effectively talking about um, you know the cover that I might need or the cover that my, my my wife might need should something occur um, unforeseen uh, and you know my response is well I don't need any cover if something happens to my wife and and you know my advisor said so you're not going to grieve. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm probably going to need some time to grieve, right? It, it never dawned on me, you know, that mm. uh, as I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be out of action for a while. Right? I'm going to need to spend time with, with, with my, with my family, with my daughters. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a broken mm. soul for a period. Uh, so, right. yeah, and I'm like, how much time do I need to grieve? Because that needed to be part of the calculation That's of right. how we set up our insurances. Yeah. It's like, who would even think of that? That's it's right. like, how much time do you need to grieve? And I settled on three months. I'm like, I reckon three months before I step back into the office or um, before I get my life right. back in order. Right. Yeah. I thought, yeah, I'm going to need to get back in uh, for my own mental health, uh, but, but it'll be nice to have a buffer. That's uh, right. And I was like, who thinks about this? It's like, well, that's what advisors do. Uh, they advise us of you know all the hard things and the intelligent things, the wise right. things, because we just don't know. I'm I'm no insurance expert by any means, uh, but you've got to get good advisors. You've got to get uh, absolutely. Your advisors and almost need to be yeah. like your uh, uh, must and trust friends, the, the people exactly. that that you really yeah. um, uh, resonate with and and, and, and that, that speak to you. That's so important what you've said because. Um, you've got to take advice from people who know what they're talking about. And you can't get that advice from the internet. You can't get it from people who don't know what they're doing. You certainly can't get it by guessing. Um, you, you, can't, uh, you can't do it by assuming you know what you're talking about. But after all, assumptions in life, and we all do it occasionally, but those who do it too often realise or well, maybe they don't realise, but they should realise, that assumptions are the mother of all stuff-ups. If, if you want to ruin your life, keep making assumptions based on your limited knowledge. And so we have to get advice. We've got to talk to professionals about what's going on. For example, when I was ill, a friend of mine rang up and he said, oh, I've got this terrific treatment, blah, 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 you know, you know and it was... You know, comes from America and my friend told me it was good and all the rest of it. And I said, so what? And he said, I think you should get involved in it. And I said, gee, I said, um, uh, I tell you what you can do. You can give me the name of five people who have survived deadly melanoma because they've done what you've said and I might think about it. Well, I never heard from him again. And that's the problem. People make these statements they think it's true because Fred said it or Julie said it or something like that. It's nonsense. You've yeah, got to not, go to the right people. It's not based in reality. Well, one of the things that I always uh, think about and sometimes mention with my clients is you know, part, part of the, the value of psychology is that we actually get to hit the pause button, That's sit right. in a private yeah. room and talk about your life uh, uh, in an honest way uh, and it's something that you don't often do which is spend time on you, on your life that's and right. how you respond. And, oh, that's and, and that's what advisors mm. do. Mm. Peter, how do people get in touch with you uh, to whether just meet you, uh, see if, they, if, if um, they can get involved mm. in, in the work that you, you do or have you on their team? How, how, how does that all work? 
Well, they can certainly call me if they like. And the best place to go is to my website, uh, redefiningretirement.com.au. And you'll find all the details. There are a massive amount of information on the site. Um, There is a section there um, where you can look up all the things that we've been talking about, a resources section, if you like. Um, That type of thing will help people with the very things that we're talking about. Um, I allow people to call me, for example, one-hour interviews over the phone for a small cost. Uh, I will be happy to talk at conferences or meetings or groups or anything like that. Um, but I even do individual coaching if people want to do that. Um, it's not cheap, but usually these are people who are so busy they can't afford any time to do anything. <laughs> and so they're happy for me to come along and talk to, um, to themselves and their spouse or partner. And we do that over a one-year period. Uh, 10 modules of one hour. So there's lots of ways that people can get involved. The book will be out shortly. The, um, the internet coaching course on, tele- on, oh, sorry, on the internet will be available and uh, people might find that of particular interest to get a, an introduction to what is really important. Uh, so website, phone numbers on there, all those types of things, redefiningretirement.com.au. Fantastic, Peter. Look, I really appreciate you coming on with with, with all of your insights. Although I've uh, given thought, it's so periphery, you know, thought for for, for myself. And I appreciate you coming in, having spent so much, you know, uh, thought, time, genuine consideration and working with people in in this space. It's such an important, you know, period, you know, as you say, a 30-year plus period for, 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 for many and it's something that we uh, should spend that time and encourage people uh, to, to, to embrace a planning and, and, and conscious thinking through that time because it's uh, many opportunities open up if you do so. So I really appreciate you know, speaking speaking to me and obviously sharing with my audience. It's, it's an important topic and I, I, I imagine lots of listeners are either moving into retirement, planning for retirement, in retirement or uh, loved ones of people about to go into retirement. So you know, I'm sure there's, there's a lot to take away from, from our audience. So thank you again, Peter. Good on you, Nish. I've really appreciated it and uh Anyone who goes into your website, they can print out a, uh, a, a couple of things there or look at it and they'll see better thinking is on your website and that is what it's all about, better thinking. We've all got to do that to come up with the result that we want. And if I can finish on one point, doubt kills the magnificent. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review, subscribe, share it via social media, and tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.